All right, great. So I want to introduce to you our seminar speaker for today. It's Jim DeWolf, and he has over 27 years of experience in the planning, design, startup, and commissioning of water treatment systems. He frequently works side by side with operations staff to uh, comprehend operational requirements and facilitates dialogues at client levels to solve problems. So Jim has experience and knowledge in operations, engineering design, regulatory compliance, and that gives him a holistic approach that's earned him a, a great reputation in the water industry. So Jim is a, a U.S. Navy vet, so he served in the nuclear propulsion program and submarine service. He has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Penn State and also a Master's in Environmental Engineering from Penn State. He's a licensed water treatment operator. He's a board certified environmental engineer. Uh, he was past chair of the American Water Works Association Coagulation and Filtration Committee, and he's also a member of the Committee on Granular Media Filtration. So he's very highly credentialed. We're lucky to have him. He drove a little while to get here, so please give a warm welcome to Jim Gould. It was actually a very pleasant drive this morning from State College. It wasn't, uh, wasn't too bad at all. But uh, thanks for having me, and it's, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, you know, I want to start this by saying that you know, we talk about making a difference in the world in environmental engineering, and uh, this, this figure at the bottom of this is one thing that everyone in here is gaining an appreciation of, is that whether it's at a water plant or a wastewater plant, we have things that come in and then we have things that go out. It's what happens in that proverbial black box that makes you know, an, an understanding about what's happening there. So, you know, that's what we do as engineers and, and scientists in and, and, and our profession. But it's uh, not just how we find out about it, it's how we communicate that and get that uh, word back out and how we make those improvements and make those uh, changes to help optimize them. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first, I, I, get, I get paid to lay down on the job uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, and I spend a lot of my time assessing filters. You know, it's that uh, final physical barrier in a, in a water treatment process. But uh, it, it, it involves, you know, getting in into the nitty gritty of, of really finding out what's going on within, within these processes. And uh, here's another picture where I actually get a chance to put my lips up against something to communicate with somebody who's at another level below me there. But uh, so it's, I'm, I'm very lucky I get a chance to get involved with my work. It's not a lot of uh, sitting behind a, a desk type activity. Uh, safety first and foremost all the time, but uh, I also get a chance to uh, work with uh, some great colleagues and uh, those folks that do typically get more or, or do more typical design stuff, traditional design stuff, uh, I give them an appreciation of what's going on as well. So I do a lot of teaching and a lot of uh, communicating in, in the course of this effort. And uh, yes, there are women involved in, in, this, in this field. This is our filter queen here. Uh, that's her uh, the name that I gave her. That's her scepter. But uh, it, it's a great it's a great industry, you know, and it's a, it's a great place for a, a lot of really good opportunity. I will give you a, a little bit of appreciation about who I am and where I where I come from. Um, I did my first water project when I was eight years old. I helped my father uh, cap a spring on an alluvial uh, spring across a creek, creek, depending <laughs> upon the part of Pennsylvania you're from. And uh, then after capping that, bringing it across the creek with uh, some pipe into a tank, and from that tank, then it got pumped up to the house. And I thought to myself, this is pretty cool. You know, you take water from over here and then bring it, uh, bring it up into a house and to use it. Um, then I got to the end of high school and uh, didn't quite have enough money to, to really think about going to college. So I said, okay. I'm a smart guy, what can I do with that and all this? So I found that there was a nuclear power program and, and I got involved with that and then spent six years doing it. I was an electronics technician uh, operating reactors, but I was exposed to all kinds of different engineering. Uh, the benefit of uh, you know, mechanical, electrical, uh, water chemistry. Water chemistry is very important in the nuclear industry. And so that's where I got started in appreciation of what I wanted to do with my career. So I said, okay, I could go out right now and uh, probably jump into a junior year of electrical engineering, but do I really want to do that for the rest of my life? My calling was towards that of the environmental side, so that's what I did. Went to Penn State, used that GI Bill, 
and got a, uh, a bachelor's and then had some money left over, as I was telling you before. <laughs> Might as well use it up, right? I got a master's degree as well. So with that uh, newly minted degree said, now I'm ready for the world and got a job with American Water. They're the largest private water utility in the country. Uh, it was in New Jersey, found out that I didn't really care for South Jersey that much. Moved back to Pennsylvania and got in, into the consulting business. I jokingly say the blood sucking consulting business, but it's really not that. It's uh, truly a service oriented uh, profession where uh, we get a chance to help uh, utilities of all different sizes. Not just the big utilities, not just the New York cities where I've recently completed a project, but even those as, as small as what you might see in this neck of the woods. Uh, and then I've also been involved, so here I am, 1987. It's hard to believe that's me, right? Uh, but also got involved in, and have applied these skill sets and everything to some mission work uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Can't really see how sweaty I am in this picture, but I was, came across a bicycle shop and that's one of my passions, so I was rather excited about that. Um, but uh, have, have applied it in that way as well, and uh, that's been uh, very rewarding. And then uh, another part of my life, and as far as my background and stuff, uh, my wife, a political science professor, who's going to be very happy the election's over soon. Uh, we try to find time uh, from, you know, or find the time uh, as we can to uh, enjoy those different things in life. So it's not all about work. We try to find those uh, times to do things together. So that's enough about me. So what I want to kind of talk about uh, going through the rest of this is. You know, what's the outlook for environmental engineers? You know, I don't, some of you in here, I don't know where you were in what year, but uh, my, if you're in your junior or senior year starting to think about, okay, well, what's the job market like? You know, where, where are things going? And not just what the data says, and not just what the, the trends say, but what are some of the uh, events that are happening in the world that uh, are having an influence on this? <coughs> And then I'd like to give you an appreciation of uh, some, some more technical stuff, and I'll get into that a little bit. Not too technical, but uh, enough to uh, whet your appetite as far as uh, the uh, challenges with modern filtration. And then one of the things that I get involved with a lot is optimization. So we have existing facilities, and uh, if you read the papers, revenues are down for uh, people selling water. Pittsburgh has just gone through some issues with their uh, aging infrastructure and uh, all around the country. Flint, Michigan, we hear about that. But what do we have to do with that? We have to make it work as best as it can. We can't go out and build a whole new system. We have to find ways to make it work as best as we can. So what's the outlook? 12%. This is last year. I don't know what it is now. But with a 12% increase projected in the next 10 years, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty darn good uh, that's pretty good employment security. I don't think I'll ever be able to retire. Maybe that's why you guys are so important. You got to help me retire. Um, and then you've got uh, not just that and some of those things that I've mentioned about aging infrastructure, but uh, you know there's regulations. There's the uh, you know, there's the state and the government concerns regarding that. Um, you hear a lot about more and more these days about water reuse. When I started my career, I didn't know what that was. You know, what, what's this water reuse stuff? I have no idea. Then about uh, 10 years ago, I got involved with some projects at Penn State where they spray irrigate all of their effluent. They practice reuse. That water gets sprayed out of their wastewater effluent, goes down and recharges groundwater. That, in a sense, is reuse. And that groundwater's got to go somewhere. So that's indirect potable reuse. You'll hear those terms used also. But uh, even right, right here in Ohio, my company's got a project going on right now where we're actually looking at using that wastewater effluent as to supplement what's coming out of a lake because the source water is so degraded with, uh, with algae. And in particular, those uh, cyanobacteria algae that uh, if you uh, paid any attention to the news in the last couple of years, City of Toledo had a do not use report. And can you imagine waking up in the morning and you hear do not use your water? Was it Benjamin Franklin? We don't know the worth of water until the well runs dry. So, and it's true. Um, and, the, and the thing that's sad about some of this, uh, I have a client in Georgia, not to pick on Georgia, 
but uh, they had somebody at one time call up and say to the water treatment plant and said, my hot water is not working. Can you send some more hot water, you know, down to me? So it's education of the public as well as far as where their water comes from and, and how they use it. So there's all these different things going on. A couple of things to point out here on these graphics, and, and it may not be as evident to you as it would be as me looking at the screen here, but the darker green colors, that's the employment of environmental engineers back in May of 2015. You notice it's darker down here in Texas, Florida, California. Um, typically water poor areas and where you've got more populations moving complicated by things such as climate change and some of those types of events. But even look at here, Illinois and a couple of other places, Pennsylvania. And then the wage, wages look pretty good. Can you guys read those numbers? And then some of these areas here up, uh, up around six figures and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a pretty good career as far as, you know, make, making a good living and stuff like that too. Not that that's the primary goal, but you know, it's a nice thing to know that I'm going to college for something and uh, here's a chance to at least make a good living at what I'm doing. When I say good living, I'm talking about the wages as well as being able to contribute to something that's of, uh, of critical importance to our society. This is after a significant rain event at one of the reservoirs for New York City. Up until this past year, all of the water from New York City had some chlorine added to it and then went out to the customers and some corrosion control inhibitor. They didn't have any treatment. They didn't have any of those traditional processes such as coagulation, sedimentation, filtration. I had the benefit of working on a project for the Croton Supply and did the startup and the commissioning of their first water treatment plant for the city of New York, which just came online last year. But you can imagine, if I depend upon a high quality source which the vision that the folks that founded New York City over 100 years ago had, New York City wouldn't exist if it wasn't for its water. It wouldn't exist. And they brought that water from where? The Catskills and the Delaware supplies on the west side of the Hudson, over 100 miles via these huge conduits. So all of that engineering and thought and vision that went into that helped us to have New York City. But anyway, with these kind of significant events that happen like this, these are complicating things. We hear about climate change, whether it's real or not. Well, I can tell you what is real is significant weather events. They've been happening with more regularity. Um, who in here has been somewhere where they've lost power, or a bridge has been out, or a tree branch has been across the road? Right? So those are the kinds of things that are happening. Here's a interesting graphic. This is from a research project that somebody from my company did. Hazen and Sawyer is an independently owned, in other words, we're owned, they're owned by their employees. We don't, we don't have a stock or anything like that, which is another unique aspect about us. I understand you guys were given some homework before you came here to look at our website. Anybody do that? Come on, guys. HazenandSawyer.com. <laughs> but anyway, here we, here we talk about, these are some earthquakes and then all disasters. This is from 1900 to the year 2000. Now, are we paying more attention? Are we recording those things more accurately than we had in the past? Perhaps. Nonetheless, even with the magnitude of this, it's pretty important to see that there's a lot more happening, number of events per year. Look what's happened just since 1980. This is some serious stuff. So whether you believe in climate change or not is one thing. You can't deny that there's other events happening. You just can't deny it. Climatic disasters, there you see floods between 1995 and 2000, going back to 1980, 50 up to 170 or so. That's sobering. What's that mean to you? What's that mean to our society? It means that we have to find ways, whether environmental engineers or not, to help deal with those things. And here's what we have in, in looking at it in terms of the cycle, the cycle of things that occur. So we can say it's climate change, which results in increased weather volatility, which impairs water quality. Then guess what? I have to apply more treatment, more energy intensive treatment. So I use more power. I use more power, greenhouse gas emissions. One of those things. So what we have to look at when we get down to this point 
is how do we slow down that cycle and how do we find more efficient ways, again, to use what we have in place right now, those traditional methods of treatment, rather than just throwing technology at it. Israel, anybody travel to Israel? One of the world leaders in water treatment in terms of desalina desalination. So how have they been able to do that? Applied a lot of power and generate, and generate a lot of power to be able to run those reverse osmosis systems because I need big pumps because I'm putting it through requires a lot of pressure. Very important to use what we have. Five years ago or so, this is just, I'm using this as an example. What is your overland? Tennessee. Anybody have any family in Tennessee or from Tennessee or whatever? Did you hear about what happened down there? It was pretty bad. Um, one in 1,000 year flood. And you'll hear that more and more again about the 1,000 year floods. How about Colorado? Anybody got any family in Colorado or friends in Colorado? Town of Jamestown near Boulder, Colorado. Do a recent uh, severe weather event there. The town was wiped out. Smaller town, but an extreme event about what can happen. What else is going on out there? Along with, uh, you know, we've got wildfires that are happening also. Colorado has pine bark beetles. What do pine bark beetles do? Pine bark beetles. Anybody ever hear pine bark beetles? Pine bark beetles have an impact on the evergreens and stuff that grow out there. The evergreens and stuff that grow out there are now dying. They die off. All of that debris goes down, and guess what? Now I've got a greater propensity for forest fires. The other thing it does, it adds more organics to the soil. So now all of these front range utilities out there that have been used to treating their water, their, their snow melt water, you know, they used to make the joke, you blow on it and you treat it like that. That's all we have to do. Not anymore. Now they have organics to deal with. They have these large sediment loads to deal with. So again, the, the implications here are, sta or, you know, are, are sobering, staggering, whichever term you like to use. More on droughts and floods, Missouri, Mississippi, and the Texas drought. Here's another interesting thing that's happened with the Texas drought. So we have a drought, reservoirs go down, they lose the path, they, they've lost their ability to hold, you know, they don't have as much water in them. Then I get a big rain that comes in, and it fills it back up. Well, big picture wise, I've got a reservoir that was drained down and I had all this vegetation growing out there now. Now all that's in the water and it's dissolving. It's dissolving into the water now. What is it doing? It's changing the water quality that I have to treat. I just had a project, I was there for two weeks ago, helping them address what do I do now that my source water quality has changed so much because of a significant weather event. So again, this is, uh, this is from a research report that the, our, our company did with some folks from Australia. But uh, again, and Australia knows a lot about severe weather events. They probably knew about this and were profiling this long before us. But again, this stuff is happening. And guess what's happened at the same time? You guys have got great laboratory facilities here. I was given a tour of it here recently and I was very impressed. So we've got better ability now to provide analytics on what's happening within various waters to detect different compounds. There are correlation studies, health effect studies, identifying the, uh, the impacts of uh, different things in the environment. And over the course of time, because we've been able to detect these things and correlate the health effects, now we have more regulations. So before it used to be maybe one or two, three things, four things, you know, back in the early 1970s, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act implementation. But as time has gone on, there's been more and more regulations. Severe weather impacts, more regulations. Gee, Jim, you're painting a pretty grim picture. What are we going to do about this? Anticipated future, this is some survey data. So a lot of surveys around the world were asked, what do you think about what are gonna be some of the bigger impacts that you're gonna have? 
Do we have a pointer on here? Yep, uh, right between, just above that we're using to oh, advance. Look at that. <laughs> Rain, snow melt changes, big concern. Drought right up there with it. You know, about 40% of utilities said we're worried about that stuff. Flooding, maybe not so much. Who's worried about earthquakes? Don't ask the people in Oklahoma. Why are the people in Oklahoma having earthquakes? Hydraulic fracturing. What are we going to do with this uh, produced water, this fracking water that we have, and, and the concentrate from it? Let's just put it in there. That's good thinking, right? We're learning the consequences of some of these things. The accountability aspect that, that has to be factored into some of this stuff. Oh, who's worried about wind and freezing and stuff like that? Maybe not so much. But again, you can see that right up there are some of these things, which are the things that we hear about in the news that are becoming more prevalent. Okay, what do we need to do in response to that? Well, I need to look at my facilities, how I operate them, operation and maintenance, along with the design. This is, uh, everybody's in agreement, this is a big deal. Remember that 12% increase in jobs and stuff that I mentioned before? This is where it's coming from. How do I deal with this? This is this kind of is validation of where some of those numbers are coming from as far as the need for environmental engineers in the world today. Maybe it's not just one source. Maybe I've got a reservoir and a lake and a river. So I've got to manage all of these different sources, and because of the environmental consequences, I've got to, I've got to monitor and, and look at them and manage them differently. What else do you see up there? Surface source volume decrease. In other words, I don't have the water available to me that I used to. What's this wastewater effluent? What's that pipe doing that's just discharging in here, right? Maybe I can use that. Direct and indirect potable reuse. You'll hear a lot about that in maybe some of your coursework or as you read through technical journals. It's real and it's happening. Eutrophication of sources, disinfection byproducts, algae. Ask the folks in Toledo what they felt when they were told they couldn't use their water because of algae. You know what the culprit was for the city of Toledo? You know what caused that algae bloom? What the root cause of it was? It was how they were managing agricultural fields. The implementation of tile drainage systems to help with the growth of plants and increase the yields. Why do we need higher yields? Because we have more people. We have more people, so we're going to need more land cultivated. <coughs> God bless you. We're going to need more. We're going to have to make sure that we have more crops per square uh, you know, or I'm sorry, per acre of, of land that we have out there. So by doing that, they said that's great. And even though they may not have been applying as much fertilizer, those tile drains were taking that soluble phosphorus, then it was going to discharge out to where? The Maumee River. Discharges in the Maumee River, goes out in the Lake Erie. The wind hits it just right, it's all bioavailable phosphorus, boom. The algae bloomed. Distribution system water quality. I can make perfect water. I mean absolutely everything perfect about it, and I mean chemically stable, you know, neutral pH, uh, all those good things, low organics going out the door, but then what? Guess what? It goes into a distribution system. It goes into pipes, and in a lot of cases, in a lot of uh, 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 communities around the country are over 100 years old. Flint, Michigan, New York City, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, you live nearby. Anybody hear the news recently about Pittsburgh? Changing of erosion control inhibitors and an agent system and the impacts of that. So we can't forget about what happens in the distribution system. So here again, you're telling me, Jim, that I've got source water challenges, I've got to treat the water better, but now, okay, I've got that figured out. And now that I've made that good water, I put it in the distribution system, now what? It has to be managed. 
appropriately. We have to reduce residence times, and I have a slide here a little bit later, I'll talk about that. And then there's a course of other things here. Here's something that I get involved with, staff experience and availability. Making sure that the staff is empowered to understand these things, and you know, these newer technologies, and these new regulations. Does anybody have a guess what the median age is for a water treatment plant operator? 40 to 60 years old. 40 to 60, come on, narrow it down, Ryan. Okay, uh, if I had to go for it, I'd have to say 55. 55. That's only Sometimes when I do training, I throw out candy bars, but you're absolutely right. It's like around 55, 56 years old. People my age. I want to retire tomorrow. That's disturbing. That means that people that are perhaps considering what they're going to do in their careers, what they're going to do in life that may not have gone to an advanced degree or something like that, graduating high school, looking for a trade, maybe have an associate's degree, are saying no to these industries. Why are they saying no to these industries? Because this industry may not pay as well, or I've got to do shift work. The human aspect of this is huge. There are campaigns for this now, beginning uh, you know, amongst the different professional organizations to try to reverse this, but many people are saying like, holy cow, what are we gonna do? First of all, you gotta pay more money. We pay too little for our water in the United States. And that may sound like a political statement, but if you look around, if you look at any of the resources that are out there and what people pay for water, especially in Europe, compared to what we pay for in the United States, it's, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a big difference. You need that money, not just to maintain the infrastructure. You need that money to make sure that you're paying people good wages. Okay, I'll get off that horse. Whoops. <coughs> but get a, an appreciation now that there's a lot going on here with respect to this profession. That it's not just the technical stuff. I don't just add chemicals and then wait for it to settle and then filter and then people pay me money for it. There's a lot going on. Distribution systems, again, the reduced consumption because industries, industrial use is down. People's wages aren't what they used to be. I don't want to use that water, it costs money. Leak detection and correction are very important because I've got to maintain that system. I've got to maintain that ability to deliver that water so the sophisticated technologies that are now being used to detect those leaks and correct those in distribution systems is pretty important. But with longer residence times that are in the distribution system, higher water, higher water ages, I've also increased the disinfection byproducts because I've got water is now in contact with chlorine and other disinfectants for a longer period of time. And with that, trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, and other disinfection byproducts, the consequences of disinfecting the water, those chemicals are now becoming of concern if more than they were before. Oh my gosh. So, Heard about where the careers are going here, what the outlook is. Hope I haven't scared you too badly about the consequences of you know, some of these significant environmental events and everything and what that means in terms of our society. But those things mean there's opportunity. There's opportunities to do more with less. Everybody familiar with turbidity? Raise your hand if you're familiar with turbidity. Okay. Turbidity is essentially the cloudiness of water. It's like, okay, if I'm looking at a glass of water and I see it's cloudy compared to a glass that's clear, it's more turbid. So it's got more stuff in it that are, you know, that are uh, refracting the light and changing direction of the light. So we measure that using turbidity. The interesting thing about turbidity is it's normally associated with the microbiological quality of the water also. Because some of those particles are pathogens that then make people sick. Those particles are also uh, places that where they can, those pathogens can hide out. So if I add a disinfectant, now I'm not able to maybe disinfect it with the efficiency that I was if it was clear. 
So back, you know, around the time that I was born, maybe that's what's the matter with me, uh, 10 MTU of water was okay. That's fine, right? 1962 to 76, people are starting to become more aware of water. They're starting to do these health studies that show, hey, maybe if the water's not so turbid, we'll get uh, less sickness. And plus, some of the technologies were advancing. We were learning a little bit more about how chemistry is used. The Safe Drinking Water Act comes into play. Now we're really going to put the hammer down. One end to you. So I've gone from 10 down to 1. Here I am at the present, 2016. We have this thing called the Partnership for Safe Water. It's a volunteer program in the drinking water industry where, that people, that utilities participate in to prove and to show that their facilities are optimized and they're producing the best water that's possible. The goal for that is 0.1. You want to know the really interesting part of this? The technology that we use, multimedia filter or multimedia filtration, that final bar physical barrier. That technology hasn't changed much. We've learned a lot more about the, uh, the benefits of the, the size of that media and what it can do for us. People are starting to use granule activated carbon instead of anthracite coal. But we've lear also learned that it's what happens in front of filtration that's important and how we operate those filters that's important. This is, now I'm trying to set the stage about optimization. In other words, using an older design and making it work better and more efficiently. But it's not just the final barrier to filtration. There's other things that these filters are doing for us. Iron and manganese control. Your plant has, is a green sand plant here, uh, which means it's removing iron and manganese. See this black roundness on this, on this media here? That At one point, that was all angular. This happens with any media that's used over the course of time when it's oxidizing dissolved iron and manganese. It gets coated, and when it gets coated, it's not as angular, which means it's not taking out the particles as efficiently as it should. So this is something that we track. That black box stuff that I was talking about before, this is, this is, this is where it's going. Taste and odor control, the type of media that's used to absorb some taste and odor compounds, are also something else to keep in mind and the bacteriological stability, the amount of organics that are removed. What did I say before? As much biology as possible and as much chemistry as necessary. That's how we're starting to look at water treatment. When I was going to college, if somebody said you're gonna use biological treatment in a water treatment plant, I would have thought they were crazy. But now, we're starting to embrace it. In the United States. In Europe, they've been doing it for years. Those Europeans, they're always ahead of us. Those people in France, Germany, Belgium, other places. So again, we're starting to look at bacteriological stability and how we can make sure that we're removing the organics, essentially that food, those substrates for their growth out in the distribution systems. Biofilm management and control, reducing that water age, all these things come into play. This is an example of what happens with the sand layer over time if you've got iron in the water. So you think about the sand color, what do you think? You think, okay, it's a lighter tan color. That's what happens to it over time. You know, it, something that's interesting here, <coughs> we've got all these analytical tools that are out there, but guess what? A lot of the times, it's just our observation, powers of observation that are important for us. Like it doesn't take... I don't have to do any analysis on this to see that this media is rounded. I don't have to do any analysis on it to see that it's discolored. And over the course of time in your careers, those are the kind of skills you'll start developing. And when I teach courses to operators, one of the things I ask them is, what's the most important process in water treatment? I'll say, I don't know, disinfection? And I'll, then I'll, hit, I'll get a whole bunch of different answers. But you know, the answer is, you are. The operators, the human factor is the most important process. And then I ask them, what's the most important instrument? Turbidity, nope. Disinfectant residual, nope. 
your vision. And then I, and something that they can very well relate to, there are no blind water and wastewater treatment plant operators. There aren't, because of the power of their observation. Now I did it. Presentation's over. <laughs> Now I stood over here at work. You might have to go to the keyboard. I might have to go to the keyboard. Sorry, Joe. Oh, gosh, the keyboard. It's like losing a TV remote. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so as much biology as possible, as much chemistry as necessary, now I'm starting to talk about these things like biofiltration. Well, guess what? You've been doing the wastewater for a long time. Trickling filters and a wastewater process. Been used a lot. What, what, what do we use at this wastewater plant? What's the main? Is it activated it's sludge? Activated sludge. Aeration. Activated sludge. Mechanical aeration. Mechanical aeration. But the drivers for this biofiltration, we have the degrading water supplies that I mentioned before, climate change, the regulations, consumer sensitivity. Does that matter? Oh, yeah. Sensitivity? What's that mean? Aesthetics. What's the first thing you notice about a glass of water? Color, how clear it is. What's the next thing? I smell it. So then I taste it. A lot of these things that we find objectionable about some waters, the smell and the taste of it, those aren't regulated. Those compounds aren't regulated. The chemical names for some of those are methyl isoborneal, geosmin, some of those naturally occurring algal byproducts, they're not regulated. But what causes the consumer to lose their confidence? How it smells and how it tastes. That's another challenge added on top of everything else. Try one more time. It didn't work. Maybe I turned it off. So what do we have? We have a balance of priorities. We've got you know, things with filter runtime, contaminant removal. Filters have to stay, you know, maintain their particle removal. Disinfection byproducts. Oh my gosh, Jim, throw out some acronyms with me. A similar organic carbon. And so now I've got all these things to worry about. But guess what? You can't be overwhelmed. You have to categorize these and prioritize and have an analytical method, a lot, you know, a, a, a good methodology by which to go about and take care of them. How do we do that? We optimize. So I'm just going to run through a couple of examples here of optimization for you to gain an appreciation of that. The goals of this are to use what we have to the maximum extent possible. The other thing there is that human factor, making sure that the staff is, is enhanced as much as possible throughout this whole thing. That they are leveraging their tools, their observation powers and everything to keep these processes as optimized as, as much as they can. And we don't just do this one time. This is a philosophy. This is gospel. This is, I'm just going to make sure that I maintain this approach and this outlook and how I manage this facility going forward. And it's a process because there is no one endpoint. There are targets and goals, key performance indicators that I look at, but there really is no endpoint. It's always a process. The other thing that I find is a challenge is that out of the almost 200 water treatment plants that I've been in in my career, not one of them, not one, is the same. There is something unique, just about like everybody in this room is unique and different all those water treatment plants. You, so you can't go in there with like preconceived notions. You have to make sure that you're looking at it from the big picture. And then it's also, it's not just what happens in that final barrier, because a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on this filtration, that turbidity value that I showed you. Oh my God, it's gotta be low. No, I have to worry about everything that happens and what gets recycled within the process. I have to look at the big picture without observations. And why we do this is because of all those things that I mentioned. There's the regulatory drivers. There's public involvement, that customer influence, 
the taste, the smells, the, and all of that. It also provides some insurance for these for these utilities, because if I've got a you know a finer tuned, better performing plant, it reduces you know, or I'm sorry, it provides more of a barrier to any kind of a unfortunate thing occurring in terms of violating a regulation. Minimizing costs and maximizing efficiency. It's all about the, the almighty dollar in some cases because, again, there's less revenue. We don't have that public funding like we used to. It all has to do with what comes in the door by virtue of how much water we sell. In some cases, it's limited chemical availability. Back around 2008, with the, the uh, economic downturn, one of the other consequences of that was because there was an economic downturn, some chemicals weren't getting manufactured as, as, uh, in, the, in the same magnitude they were before in the same volume. What, you mean I can't, I don't have a chemical to use now? So they had to find other chemicals to use. So we go from the status quo towards optimization. We say optimize pre-treatment, and it all starts up front with the clarification process. Again, making sure that I have a lower clarified turbidity so my filters don't have to work <laughs> as hard. But also making sure that if I do have taste notice and I'm using any kind of activated carbon, that its use is optimized in conjunction with all these other goals. Iron and manganese, making sure the oxidants that I add to the water to address the iron and manganese are taken care of. And if I have algae in the water, and if it varies seasonally, sometimes it goes away. But how do I adapt that process to be able to handle no matter what happens? Again, that's the spirit of optimization. And we carry about this because I can have a million mile Volvo, but guess what? The reason it got to a million miles and I was able to drive it that long is because I maintained and I paid attention to how I was operating it. Those oil changes happened. You know, I went in for those service appointments. Probably a good car to start with, right? Yeah, it's cold, At least that era, maybe. But again, you get the idea that it's how we pay attention to and maintain this equipment and optimize it is how we're able to get the most out of it. Another thing that I say about optimization is that just because you're meeting the regulations all the time doesn't mean you're optimized. We haven't had a violation in 25 years. Well, good, but you're using 25% more chemical than what you need to. And that's costing you. There are influences, as we mentioned in the beginning of the presentation about the source water. I hope I drove that point home pretty hard because that's one of the things that's driving this career is what's happening in the world. But also in the distribution system as far as the aging infrastructure and those pipes out there. Um, Civil engineering folks have done numerous studies on this and graded the infrastructure in the United States being between a D and an F. That's something we need to pay attention to. Data management, holy cow. I've got all these ways of, you know, you ever hear SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. So now I've got all these analytical tools that are out there, gathering all this information and sending it into a computer because I have to report it, number one. Number two, the operators need assistance in knowing what to do. But if I gather numbers for the sake of gathering numbers, what good is that? So guess what? There are ways of taking that information and doing correlations and looking at it the appropriate way. That thing called statistics? Who loves statistics? No, <laughs> I get some shaking heads in the back. Time series analysis. That's my wife got. And then the other thing is, instead of just writing numbers down on paper, is looking at the trends. You know, if, if you plot data manually, or if you're looking at a, you know, in a, or in Excel, and I take that group of data and I develop all these different trends and everything, how are those trends shifting the rate of their change and everything? You know, how, how important is that? 
So I, now I'm looking at that information that's coming back to me. It's what's coming out of these systems that's important to know whether or not I'm optimized. And there's always more than what meets the eye. You know, with filters, we look at these things because a lot of the times we look at them. You saw, remember that picture of me laying in the filter? Well, most of the time that filter is covered with water. I can't lay on a filter when it's covered with water. So I actually have to get in there and look at it and, and uh, literally dig into them to understand what's going on. So and again, it's knowing how often to do that, how often to do those forensics. They're also important, and that can be part of the whole optimization process. Filters. I had to have a slide with equations. But the way we look at these filters and the media and everything is understanding, and again, the point here is that there are different mechanisms by which we, these things happen, but it all happens here. It's all chemistry. It all happens with the particle charge that are on those particles and understanding what happens within there. Gratuitous engineering drawing. This is a filter. Everybody seen a filter in any of your classes before? Or water comes in and it filters through here? The important thing to remember is that when we take these particles out of the water that are left over from the clarification process, we're storing them. We're not removing them. We're storing them. So then we have to backwash them out and remove them to make that filter ready to use again. And sometimes we can just look at, again, looking at what's happening on the surface. Here's a substantial accumulation of biological material. We know there's something goofy going on and we have to investigate it. We also compare what it was designed to what it is now. And whether that's 10 years later, 5 years, 20 years later, how does it compare to what it was originally? And how has that changed over time, and why? Most people are happy, right? <laughs> They're Canadians. They have to be happy. <laughs> but in our course of, of doing this, and one of the benefits of this work is engaging staff and getting them involved in this process so that they realize that, hey, we can do this ourselves. So part of what we do as environmental engineers is we're empowering people. We're giving them the tools and the skills necessary to be happy about what it is they're doing and, and engaging in that. Halifax water. Everybody been to Nova Scotia? My gosh, is it nice up there. Powers of observation. This is a uh, chunk of media that I took out of a filter in, uh, in Florida. And I knew right away there was problems. <laughs> because if, uh, when I take a chunks of like that out of a filter, there, there's going to be some issues. And if I see media rounded like that, that I also know there's some issues. So the point that joke that I normally make, it's like filter media as big as my head. <laughs> Get an appreciation of this, that it's power of observation, empowerment. All those things. Here's another one. Looking at it throughout the course of a media, just another example of the power of observation. What's happening in the top half inch is different than what's happening just 12 inches down. It's the fun stuff. So that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, Israel was one of the leaders for the desalination, but is that because of an increase in power or they have been more to optimize their systems? Repeat that about who was that? You said Israel. Was a well, Israel being a leader, right? Well, they, they're essentially a water poor country, so their fresh water supplies are not as great as what, what we may have here, especially in the central Pennsylvania. So, what's the only other water they have available? That's what's, you know, out, out in the. Uh, in the Mediterranean, in other areas, in many areas. So they're taking that brackish water, putting it loose in very tight membranes, pushing it through there, and, and then getting a reverse osmosis water. Or distillation in some cases. 
But again, those are energy intensive because if I have to pump that water before I power it off. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Whatever you say is energy intensive, like how intensive is it? How much did you cost? So the question was, how energy intensive is it? I'm going to put it in relative terms because I, I really don't have the numbers off the top of my head when we're talking about how much energy is in power system. For a conventional, let's put it this way, reverse osmosis plant, nanofiltration plant can be up to 10, require as much as 10 times power. That's a lot. Just to operate the pumps to push that water through. So that's putting it in relative terms. Yes. Just a quick question from just some data we got over myself. Um, when it comes to first stage filtration systems at the beginning of the, it's straight from the influent right before it enters the plant, uh, okay. would you prefer bar screen filters or gran granulated systems? So the question was, as water's coming in, would I prefer a bar screen or you know something like that? And they, the, the answer is, the pre-treatment, is it, it, it's gonna vary. So there is no selection of what preferred technology is what is specific to the needs of that, whatever that source is. So it may be, in some cases, uh, if it's pre-treatment, instead of uh, conventional sedimentation, it may be flotation prior to the filtration process. Because if I have particles that don't want to settle, let's float them. That's just an, an example. I don't that answers your question. No, that, that does. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? Do, uh, do those media particles get grounded just because of wear and tear? Does, do they get older? Is it just, just specifically because there's a problem? So the question was, the question is, do the, does those media particles get rounded just through use, or is it because of chemical deposition? And it can be both. It can be the mechanical agitation, which is taken off those sharp edges, or it can be a, a chemical deposition of some uh, inorganic hydroxide. It can be both. Anybody else? Hey, Jim. Yeah. Here at lunch, you made a comment about success in a career path and the importance of interpersonal skills. Would you mind just talking about ah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, we're talking about how, you know, we're working really hard for getting these degrees, you know, and, and trying to get good grades and everything, right? We're all doing that, I did that too. But uh, one of the things that uh, is really important, irrespective of your career, but in, particularly in this business, are those communication skills. And I understand here you've got a great program where you, the technical reports are required in every class and you may sometimes say to yourself, oh my gosh, why do I have to write another report? Because you're writing a report that's specific to the material number one, but everything you do you have to communicate. You've got to be able to communicate that information to your clients who are eventually going to use it for the betterment of public health. So that's why it's really important. And it really doesn't matter what your career is, but it's particularly valuable in any engineering field. And some of you may say, well, I know some friends that uh, they got a job with an engineering firm and then they just sat there at a desk and worked on equations and stuff. Well, maybe that's not the right engineering firm to work for. Being able to communicate both verbally and in the written way is absolutely important. And especially the when you're communicating with them, because what, what's it all about? It's about trust. It's about how they are trusting what you're telling them. So you can have the perfect answer, but if you don't say it convincingly, they may not believe you. It's all about trust. And I would say probably more than any of the other stuff that I learned in school, that was one of the things that I think has been good for me anyway, is, is making sure that my clients feel that they can trust me. That's of absolute importance. So hopefully that yeah. conveys what you're wanting me to highlight. So we're out of time. Thank you for staying a couple minutes late. Let's thank our speakers.